Thank you, thank you very much. So um, I, I'm very excited to tell you about the progress that at least I'm making in my head about how machine learning could really be transformative for a lot of areas of um, science and scientific discovery where there is the possibility of uh, collecting lots of data in each experiment and also designing fairly complicated experiments that human minds have a hard time to manage and where I think machine learning is gonna be a key. So, right. So the kind of uh, scientific iterative discovery process that we want to throw machine learning into is like this. Um, we, at any moment, we have some data that we have accumulated from a number of experiments. So think about drug discovery. Uh, maybe we've tried a bunch of drugs or we've experimented with different interventions on this cancer cell or whatever it is, or, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, medically related. It could be physics, could be chemistry, could be biology. And then we take that data and we analyze it. Uh, we want to use machine learning for that. We want to build models of that data to understand it. Um, now, there's an important part. The next uh, thing in the loop is for any given data set, there could be multiple theories that explain it. And that's why I'm going to try to convince you that you have to be Bayesian so that you can entertain all these theories, at least as many as you can. Once you have that, um, what you want to do next is to decide what's going to be, you know, the next batch of experiments. Typically, we can, I say batch because we can do many experiments in parallel. And the fact that you know something about the different uh, explanatory hypotheses that could explain the data is very important here, as I'll argue, because you want to design the experiment so that you can reduce the uncertainty uh, in your model, that you can uh, reduce the, uh, yeah, that, that you can do an experiment that brings you as much information express as mutual information about the, the distribution you have over hypotheses that explain the data. And of course you do the experimentation that that's, could also involve machine learning if you have robotics or something, and that gives you the next data. So that's the loop like that we care about. Um, yeah, and then this loop used to be done manually with people, um, but it's getting difficult with uh, especially modern tools in many sciences, especially biology, where um, you have tons and tons of data that you know exist from different forms already that you have at your hand, and each experiment could be massive in the amount of data it generates. So, like a human brain with eyes and ears and so on cannot process all that data easily. Um, and so, yeah, we need machine learning. But in addition. Uh, where it gets complicated is also designing the next experiments um, could be a very high dimensional object. So it's not just, okay, a few things to try, like maybe try this gene or that gene, but maybe you have a combination of things that you can try or you think about drugs, you know, you, you have uh, 10 to the 60 potential drugs you could potentially synthesize or you design uh, DNA sequences and you have like, again, an exponentially large number of these so uh, we can't just uh, hope that humans are gonna come up with maybe the 100,000 such sequences that could be the, 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 the definition of the next experiment. Um, another thing that makes uh, these, these problems interesting and, and complicated is that whether we are searching in the space of uh, theories um, or the space of experiments that we could carry um, that could be good, that could be interesting, valuable for us. It's often a problem of searching a needle in the haystack. In other words, most of the things we could try or most of the theories we could come up with are wrong or bad, are not interesting. And, and, and there's a huge number of them. So you can't enumerate them. Like, it's not like, oh, I have theory one, theory two, theory three there's an exponential number of theories or there's an exponential number of say potential interventions or drugs or something that you care about. Um, and there's a tiny fraction of those that uh, somehow matter to you. So um, yeah, so we're gonna need machine learning to help generate candidate theories or candidate 
say drugs or candidate um, uh, experiments we could do. Now, um, because there are so many possibilities um, that explain the data or could be useful to do in the next experiment, I'm gonna suggest that uh, we should think about um, uh, the problem of like searching in that space, not as a problem of optimization, but a problem of exploration. So if you think about the different theories or the different drugs or uh, you could try, there are many that are compatible with things you know. And it's not sufficient to just find one that works. And I'll argue why, I'll argue why but if you think about theories, uh, you, you, know, you, wanna, you wanna know if there are multiple theories that are consistent with your data because they might produce different answers to questions you care about. And that could be a big problem if you don't take that into account. Um, in the case of drug discovery, for example, uh, you want diversity of these you know, possible solutions like possible drugs, because the way that you're going to evaluate each of these candidates, each of these possible theories, these possible drugs or whatever, is imperfect. For example, we might do uh, in vitro experiments to test different uh, therapies. And the in vitro experiment is not the real thing. The real thing is, you know, you, you inject that into a human being and you see what happens, uh, you know, years later. And that's too expensive. We can't do that on a massive scale, but we can do in vitro experiments on a massive scale. So in other words, the, uh, the, the reward function or the, uh, the objective function that we're gonna be using to uh, search in that space is, is wrong. I mean, it's, it's an approximation of what we care about. And so it's a good idea to keep multiple solutions. You know, maybe uh, my model tells me that these 100 drugs might work. I don't know, and, and they might all work in vitro, but you know, maybe only three of them will work in human beings because there are other factors that are not taken into account in the in vitro experiment. So we often have this uh, funnel of more more and more expensive evaluations. And, um, and so uh, we want a, a method that will propose candidates uh, that yields a diversity of candidates. So if, if there are maybe different types of drugs or different modes of action in biology, we would like to somehow cover these. So this is a desiderata. Um, and um, okay, so, so what are we gonna do? There's, there's, there's a lot of threads in machine learning that we can get inspiration from. One of the oldest ones is um, active learning and, uh, and, and, and Bayesian optimization that seem like good tools to look at in order to design experiments. So this is not the modeling part, this is the experimental design part. Right? Remember, if we go, back to my big cycle here, sorry. sorry. Yeah, so the, the, there are two main parts where machine learning comes in. There's the modeling part, we have data and we build models and these models should be Bayesian so they can entertain multiple uh, explanations. And we have the experimental design part where we design the next experiments. So, so now, yeah. Um, active learning and Bayesian optimization are methods to do the experimental design. Um, they essentially define a kind of objective that has to do with um, uh, how uncertain an experiment might be, or if they're, you know, more accurately, we want to know how much information we expect to gain by running a particular experiment. And then we uh, take a list of candidate experiments and we select the one that has the highest score. So that score is called the uh, acquisition function in the Bayesian optimization literature. But there's a problem with these approaches and, and you know, active learning, classical active learning is like this as well, which is that it, you know, it tells you approximately how to score each possible, say experiment you could do, but the number of possible experiments is usually not something you can enumerate easily, right? Maybe there's 10 to the 60 possible experiments. So even though I could, given an experiment, evaluate how good 
you know, my current model tells me it would be, uh, there is no way I can try all to the 10 to the 60 in the computer to, to, to choose which one I will do. So that's, enough, that's a problem we need to deal with. And in order to deal with this problem, what I'm going to suggest is we're going to use another thread from machine learning, which is generative models. And, and, and uh, you know, reinforcement learning, which are related, uh, as we'll see. So, so think of, uh, we'd like to train a generative model. So generative models sample from some distribution. And, uh, and, he, and what we would like to do here is have a distribution that uh, samples things that are valuable to me often and, and doesn't sample the things that are not interesting. Right? So, so as I said, we, using our model and using like fairly classical techniques, we can in principle compute a score for each possible experiment, but there's an almost infinite number of experiments. So I can't try them all, but I could train a generative model that gives a high probability to the good experiments and a low probability to the bad experiments. Um, and, um, and then I don't need to explicitly look at all the possible experiments. I just train it and I'll explain how we can do that. And then it generates experiments, hopefully that have a high score, right? So you never need to like explicitly enumerate. Right, and an advantage now, uh, how are we going to train this? Is, so what, do we, what is it we want from that model? As I said, we want diversity. So actually by training a generative model, we're going to get, we're going to solve two problems. So one problem is we don't need to enumerate all the possible experiments. We're going to have this generative model that samples candidate experiments. Um, the other thing is we can make that generative model sample candidate solutions, candidate experiments with a probability proportional to some scoring function. So the things that have a high score will come more often. And if we do that, then we will cover all of the possible types of solutions, all of the modes of this objective function, this reward function, right? This is, this is important for diversity. In other words, we're gonna get diversity because naturally if you sample IID from a distribution, you know, it, it will not just focus in one place. It will sample from everywhere that has high probability. So we will cut kind of, it's a heuristic if you want to cover the modes. Right, now let's go back to this question of what it is that, what kind of score do we want to decide that an experiment is interesting? So this, we're still in the experimental design part. At the end of the talk, I'll talk about the modeling part a bit more. To understand how we can compute these scores and the, what sort of thing are we looking for, you, you have to make a distinction between what's called aleatoric uncertainty and epistemic uncertainty. So if you look at random things going on in the world and you're trying to make predictions about them, there are two ways you can screw up that your predictions could be wrong. They could be wrong because there is unpredictability in the world, that there is noise. And it's just, you know, even the best possible model would make mistakes. Those mistakes, that's aleatoric uncertainty. It's an unpredictable part of the world. It has nothing to do with your model. Then you have epistemic uncertainty, which is everything to do with your model. Now, your model is too small. It was trained on too little data. You know, it was not trained long enough, you know, all kinds of things. So that's epistemic uncertainty. And, uh, and, and roughly speaking, we would like to choose our experiments to minimize that epistemic uncertainty. Um, now, um, so, so what is epistemic uncertainty about? It's about lack of knowledge. That's the, you know, Greek root, um, epistemic is knowledge. So why do we lack knowledge? It's because given the limited data we see, there are multiple interpretations for that data, multiple theories that are compatible with that data, as I was saying earlier. And there is a mathematical tradition in machine learning to deal with that kind of uncertainty. It's the Bayesian tradition. Right, so I've already like, like told you about a number of threads from machine learning that we need to bring in to do all this properly. So, um, so you know, doing the proper Bayesian things is, is intractable, um, but there are lots of approximations that are reasonable and people use. So for example, a very simple one is uh, that, that, that's quite good actually is the, uh, what's called a deep ensemble. 
So instead of training one neural net predictor, I can train 10. They start with different random seeds, so they have different initial weights. They train on the same data. And what happens is after training on this limited data, they will typically end up making different predictions. And that the amount of uh, disagreement between the networks on a particular question is a, you know, uh, underestimating, but, but estimating nonetheless the epistemic uncertainty about that question. In other words, given the data, what we have are 10 models that are compatible with the data and yet don't agree. So that amount of disagreement is, is a very strong clue about the, um, the epistemic uncertainty for that question, for that input. All right. Um, so, so now let me connect with the reinforcement learning literature. Um, so I, I'm going to like uh, redraw the, 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 the cycle that I had before, but like putting some machine learning pieces in there. So on the right-hand side, we have the real world, you know, the, the experimental bench. We, we specify some experiments and then we get some outcomes. And we take the experiment outcome pairs, we can think of like X, Y pairs, and we put that in a, data, in a database, right? So we, we get all of the past results there. Given that database of past experimental results, we train a model, okay? So each time we do a new experiment, we have more data, we can retrain the model. Now, as I said, that model should be one that knows about its own lack of knowledge. So that it, it not only is a model that explains the data, but includes all the ways to explain the data. I mean, ideally, it's never gonna be perfect. So that's the thing in the middle. And on the left, we have this imagination machine that I've been talking about, this generative model, which we can also think as a form of reinforcement learning, because what we're trying to do is to learn a policy that um, uh, generates um, a, a trajectory of actions corresponding to the specification of an experiment. So an experiment usually is not gonna be just choose this one, that one, or that one. I mean, you can have, uh, you can enumerate experiments, but experiments usually are composed. You have a number of knobs to choose. If, you know, if designing an experiment is choosing a set of molecules, well, you have to choose each of these. And then each molecule itself you, is gonna be specified by, you know, which atoms and the formula for them and so on. So, so typically experiments, the output of this imagination machine is not like a real vector or a, a single number. It's going to be a rich compositional object. And we can use, ideas from reinforcement learning to sample these rich compositional objects through a sequence of steps. And, uh, and of course, at each step, we wanna know what we have already generated or the choices we've made in order to choose the next piece of the choice uh, that specify an experiment and then do that until we have a full uh, specification of an experiment. Then we send that experiment to the experimental bench, the real world, and we get uh, results and the cycle goes again and again. Okay. Um, yeah, so one, there's a word here I haven't pronounced yet, another thread of machine learning, which is causality. And, um, and, and the reason this is important is because it's not just like any machine learning where you've got a data set and you build something here we are in a setup that's more like in reinforcement learning where the agent is gonna do things in the world, do experiments. And those experiments are gonna, um, uh, you know, change the data that we're gonna get. So ideally we need to think about this just like we think about the problems in reinforcement learning where an agent is gonna do like a series of experiments such that you know, in the long run, it, it accumulates, you know, it gets as much uh, reward as it can. But this style of reinforcement learning is um, under a particular category called model-based reinforcement learning. So there's model-free and model-based reinforcement learning. And, and I'm sure many of you already know what this is, but in model-free, we don't have a model, as it says, uh, we just learn a policy directly from data. The problem with that is getting data here is expensive. Um, it, you know, it, and it takes time. You know, these biological experiments, they might take days or weeks. 
So we want to make sure that whatever data we have, we're going to make good use of it. Um, this is not like learning to play Go, where I can, you know, uh, play as much as I want, essentially. Um, here, a good way to be efficient about the data that we have is we first build a model of the data, and it also helps us deal with this uncertainty aspect. And then when we train the reinforcement learning agent, which is our imagination or generative model, we can query the model. And because this is happening in the computer, we can do it as much as we want, right? Whereas if we have to interact each time we, when we train the policy, if we have to interact with the real world each time, uh, it, we're gonna confounding two things. One is getting data from the real world. And the other thing is optimizing our policy so that it does the things we want. So by, by using a model-based approach, there are a number of advantages. So one is this computational advantage. I mean, it, it's, it's more than a computational advantage. It's, it's a statistical advantage because we can decouple the sort of the statistical aspect, like how many interactions am I allowed to get from the outside world, experiments I do, from the cycles of training uh, the, the, the policy. I can iterate as much as I, you know, as much compute. Uh, if I have more computations, if I can do more computations than the number of experiments I, I can do in the real world, then, then this is advantageous. The other reason why model base is good is because I can, you know, I can be Bayesian and I can be causal. So the causal part now has to do with the fact that uh, the phenomenon that we are going to be modeling, so think like understanding how a particular cancer cell works or a bacteria that we're trying to kill. Um, these phenomena have causal structure. I'm going to explain what that means in a, a soon. And uh, would like our models, um, our world model to capture that structure. And that is important because essentially what causality helps us to do is be able to predict um, um, the effect of actions that change things in the world. Like I can intervene on my cell and it's gonna be a different cell because of that intervention. The distribution of the data is gonna be different. And we need the tools of causality to do this properly. All right, so yes, that's the slide. So what is a causal model? Okay, and um, it took me a while to figure out, but it's really simple. Uh, once you kind of get the, the, the main idea is fairly simple. So normally in machine learning, we think about a distribution. Our data comes from a distribution. And you know, we have trained data, test data, and we, we assume that the test data comes from the same distribution as the training data. And that's wrong. That's not what happens in the real world because the distribution changes. We do these interventions. The cell behaves differently. Um, there are all kinds of things that can change in the world. So what a causal model is, is a family of distributions. And each distribution in that family is, is specified by what we call an intervention. For example, we you know, change one gene in the cell, or we change these three genes, or we change these five genes and we you know, throw in these uh, three drugs. Okay, so there, like, there's an exponential number of possible interventions. And so that family of distributions is very rich. Um, what modeling that whole family buys us is that, if, if, of course, if we see enough of these different oh, distributions, yeah, which you can think of different tasks, we can generalize to new distributions within that family. You don't need to see all the interventions. There's you know, an exponential number of them. But if we see some, and we can do that, like you know, in biology, we can do experiments that change the cell, and we, we, we can see the outcome of these, exper of these experiments. So, so that's what causality buys us. It, it, it buys us out of distribution generalization to distributions corresponding to say different interventions than those we, we have seen in, in, our experiment, in our experience. In addition, uh, you know, people have been thinking about causal modeling for many decades. Um, there are other inductive biases that can be exploited that typically will put more structure than what I just talked about, this notion of intervention. And that additional structure can help to generalize better out of distribution and in distribution. So one example, uh, here are four examples. So one example of such typical 
causal structure assumption is that the causal graph that relates the different random variables and says, you know, which is a direct cause of which is sparse, meaning that the variables are related to each other in, uh, in terms of simple mechanisms that involve few variables at a time. And by the way, this is not true for things like pixels in images, but it, and it, you know, so if you have an image of an experiment is, you know, the relationship between pixels is gonna to be too complicated to satisfy this. But if you think about the more high level concepts that humans make up to understand how the world works, they will typically have these properties. So like think about the equations that scientists write down. They, they have just a few variables force equals mass time acceleration, three variables, not a million. That's the sparsity I'm talking about. Another inductive bias, which you can think of coming from physics, um, which of course is causal. Uh, well, yeah, that's, that's debatable, but yeah. Um, yeah. At, at our degree of understanding of the world, it, it is. Um, it, so if you think about laws of physics, like say gravity, it's, it's a regularity that relates different masses and their movement. And the same law of physics, like the gravity law, applies to every object. They're generic. They can be reused, if you think in terms of machine learning. We have pieces of knowledge that relate different variables together. But actually, you should think of different instances of variables, like different masses. Um, and the same piece of neural net that describes this relationship between variables applies to all of the, say, triplets of variables like force, mass, acceleration, um, not just one object, right? So, so this, is a, this is an important inductive bias, which we typically don't exploit in machine learning. We have this neural net, and there's no like reusable component except the whole neural net itself. But inside it, it's not like broken into pieces that can be um, reuse depending on the context. The way we think, the way we reason often has this property that we think about different pieces of knowledge that we're gonna combine on the fly to reason about something in novel ways. Um, there is um, another uh, inductive bias called the uh, independence of causal mechanisms. It's not statistical independence, it's an information theoretical thing, but the simplest way to think about this is like the right causal explanation for how things work in the world has this property that you know if you think of it like you have multiple like physical laws if, if i had a mistake in one of them I, I got it wrong or you know some reason there's something that's changed in one of these physical laws it doesn't affect the others but one way to think about it is when you write code you try to do that you're trying to break your code into independent pieces it's not a statistical thing it's an information theory thing meaning that there is no information about one piece of code in another piece of code. Ideally, of course, you know you need some interface and stuff, but but as, as much as possible, they um, they're factorized in in this sort of uh, uh, way that is going to be robust. Meaning, if I change one of the pieces of code, I don't need to rewrite everything else. Right? Um, another thing that comes from causality inductive biases is um, something that humans use a lot, which is they assume that when things have changed in the world, it's because some agent did something and that agent did it because they had some intention. So for example, maybe somebody designed an experiment where they wanted to kill the cell, so they tried this, right? Um, by opposition to everything changing at the same time, we're saying, oh, you know, there is some, uh, some like almost exogenous thing that happened that perturbed just one or a few important high level abstract variables. And the reason I'm saying this is what we do is that when we look at something, like let's say you are, you are a human, you see things changing in the world, we try to put words on what's going on. Like we put a sentence and we say, oh, somebody, left the door open and now it's kind of cold here, right? So we, 
we organize our understanding of the world using uh, this assumption, which doesn't have to be true, but we, you know, it's a prior that can make a preference. Okay, so now whether we, um, we want to sample candidate experiments or whether we're not, we want to sample candidate theories, if you want to be Bayesian, we have this problem that we have this uh, scoring function that tells us whether a particular candidate, particular candidate experiment, candidate theory is good, uh, but we need to convert that into this generative model that I was talking about. What are your thoughts on the geometrical family of neural networks? That the, respect the what family? The geometrical families of neural networks that respect the, the symmetries found in the nature, like the- Right, right, right. Architecture. Yeah, so there are other inductive biases, of course, and uh, when in any science, so I've talked about a bunch of inductive biases here, but, but these are like very generic inductive biases, but in any scientific context, there will be more inductive biases. Right? So if you're doing like really physical things, there are all kinds of uh, equivariances and invariances um, you know, think about the geometry, you know, you can, you can have uh, space uh, equivariance. I can move things around and they basically don't change their properties except for their position. So, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of work in machine learning, uh, uh, things like physics inspired neural nets and things like that, that try to incorporate such inductive biases in neural nets. Okay, but now I would like to focus on this, this goal that, I mentioned earlier, which is we want to have uh, a, a kind of generative model, which is also a kind of policy that is trained using a score function or a, a reward function that is going to give a high value to the things we want to sample and a low value to the things we don't want to sample. And there is a uh, classical way of doing this in uh, in, in, in science, it's called Monte Carlo Markov chain methods, so and or MCMC methods, and they are the state of the art for answering this kind of question. Somebody gives me an essentially unnormalized probability, or also called an energy. Uh, I mean, e to the minus energy is is unnormalized probability, and um, an MCMC method will convert that function, which it can call right. It it, it tells me, given a candidate X, how good is it? can convert that into samples that uh, asymptotically, if you compute long enough, come from the right distribution, which is the distribution that gives probability proportional to this unnormalized probability. The problem is in many situations of interest, this doesn't work that great. In high dimensional spaces, when these regions of high score of high probability, which we call modes, are far apart from each other. Uh, there is an issue called uh, the mode mixing problem that means that practically you're going to need exponential computation in order to get good samples from your MCMC. And uh, essentially, it has to do with the fact that MCMC to generate one good sample needs to do many random little changes to that candidate. And, um, and it likes to make those changes to stay close to high probability regions. And so when it has to move from one mode, one of these you know, bumps to another one, it has to go through these trajectories of low probability and that's exponentially unlikely. And the more so, the longer the distance between the modes. So it's, it's a huge problem that nobody knows how to fix it, but we can fix it using machine learning. How do we fix it? So imagine that we had seen these three modes already. In other words, we got some X's for which we know the uh, energy, uh, like uh, the, under, the score for each of these X's and, we, and some of them happen to be around these modes. So we already have like found three modes. And, and now instead of just doing little perturbations that we do with MCMC, we might be bold and say, oh, gee, they're like landing on this grid. Maybe there's another mode at this other point where I put a question mark. That's what machine learning does. It generalizes, right? So you train 
a, a, a generative model on a bunch of faces and it will invent new faces. But in the space of faces, you know, the, the, you know, the different maybe types of faces could be quite far apart from each other. So it, it may invent something quite different from anything it has seen before. So, so yeah, that's, that's what, we can, what we can do. But we need to train these generative models, not with data, but with this black box function it can call, that's this, this reward function. So, um, uh, so, so, the, so this is called an like amortized sampler or amortized predictor. Um, and uh, that's what we do when we use machine learning in you know, settings where we would normally use MCMC methods. Instead of doing all the work at the time when we want to sample with, uh, like we do with MCMC, we instead are going to do all the work by training a neural net but that's, you know, once and for all, you pay the price. And, and then uh, when we want to sample, it's going to be very fast. So we can train this generative model. It's a lot of work to train, but then it's very fast to sample. Um, and, uh, but the, the main advantage is not even that. The main advantage is because these amortized samplers or predictors um, can generalize. So that's the thing I was talking about, that from the samples that you were able to draw to train it, it can guess other good things to generate. All right, so, so there, is, there is a whole history of these things um, in uh, machine learning. You may have heard of variational autoencoders is probably the most famous such thing. And there's now you know, a lot of models like the GANs um, that are um, uh, uh, doing this sort of amortization. Okay, so let's see how we could do that. Um, quickly, yeah, we want to learn to sample modes of this reward function. So we're given this function R, we want a generator. And so, you know, we, a uh, uh, whole group of us uh, here at Mila came up with uh, one method to do that called uh, generative flow networks. And the first paper on this was presented at the last NeurIPS. I obviously don't have time to give a talk on, on these. We, short, we call them G flow nets. Uh, you know, think of like uh, convnets for convolutional neural networks. And so this is a shorthand for generative flow network. Um, and we wrote a bunch of papers since then. In particular, there's a long paper called GFlowNets Foundations, if you want to understand a bit of the math behind. Um, and what they do is they are fairly general purpose probabilistic modeling tools um, uh, you know, build on, on neural nets and they can learn to sample from a given uh, distribution where the way you specify the distribution is with a reward function rather than with a data set. You can also train them with a data set, but the interesting bit is you can train them with this uh, uh, where they decide to call a particular function to get an unnormalized probability or reward. Um, they're also interesting because of their ability to deal with compositional objects. Um, so things like molecules, things like an experimental specification that involves many knobs that you have to choose. And maybe uh, the specification are not like a fixed size thing, like a vector. Think about a molecule um, or, you know, the, the, the specification can be seen as a set. And the problem with sets and graphs and objects like this is that when you generate them, um, it's not clear in what order you should do it. So there's classical generative models called autoregressive methods that assume you know a particular order and you're gonna always follow the same order. So GFlowNets can be trained in such a way that uh, they don't, you know, they can sample from all any order and in a way that's gonna be consistent. Right. Um, so to give you sort of a glimpse of what's going on with these GFlowNets, there are like reinforcement learning methods. So they learn this policy. So let's say we want to train a GFlow net to sample uh, graphs. Um, they're going to do this step by step, like add an edge at each step. So they take a partially constructed specification, like a partial, I mean, a graph. And so maybe it's going to be a, a graph neural net that does this. And then on output, they, you know, they have the probability for the different actions you can take. Like you can choose any of the edges that have not been selected yet and, and add it. 
So you're going to do a softmax over these possible choices. You're going to sample one of these choices. And then that is going to give you the new graph. And you're going to do this over and over until there's a special action that says, we're done. We're happy. We think we have the graph we want. And, and then you can get the reward. Was that a good graph? Was that a good drug? Was that a good theory? And, um, and, and then, you know, so we're going to train these neural nets. Actually, there are like more pieces of neural nets, but that's the main thing. It's the policy that we're learning. I'm going to skip, skip that, skip that. Uh, we uh, did show, even in the first paper, that these GFlow nets had the property that they were able to sample more diverse solutions than traditional methods in RL and for reinforcement learning or in MCMC methods. So we, we, we get these molecules that are you know, farther from each other and there are more modes, uh, more types of molecules that can be discovered. All right. Um, I want to use the last couple of minutes to tell you about the modeling part. I'm gonna skip this, sorry. Sorry, Moksh. Um, because this is his work, I, I'm skipping. Um, I mean, his and many other people. But I, I promised that I would say a few words about how these generative models that we can train, these GFlow nets or others like uh, hierarchical variational inference methods can be used on the modeling side. It's the same machinery, but now instead of generating experimental specifications, we're gonna generate models so, for example, in the case of uh, causality, we'd like one of the key pieces is generate this causal graph. Which variable is connected to which and is the direct causal uh, parent of which. And there is an exponential number of such graphs for a given number of variables. Um, so uh, there, there's a lot of work in causality to think about what's called identifiability. Like, can we even recover the graph even if we had enough data um, and in general, the answer is no. Like there are many graphs that could be compatible with the data. So what we want is to uh, have a, a neural net that can generate those graphs from what's called the Bayesian posterior distribution. In other words, all the graphs that are compatible with the data and those that are more compatible will be sampled more often. And how compatible they are is something we can compute. It's the likelihood times a prior but it's something we can compute. The problem is that just like in the other thing with experimental design that there are too many possible graphs. I cannot enumerate them. I have a way to score any particular one. But so what I can do is use something like this GFlow net to sample from this posterior distribution. And we can just train the GFlow net using as a reward the, the likelihood times the prior of a particular graph, All right? Which are things we can compute like in, in a fairly standard way, All right? So we, we have a first paper that does this sort of thing that was presented at uh, UAI, uh, led by Christian Deleu, and again, a bunch of other people, including uh, Simon Lacazouillet. And um, yeah, this is it's just a slide showing that the reward function here is something you can derive from the likelihood and the prior and uh, that you can compute based on your data. Right, I'll um, stop here, there's a... Uh, GFLNet tutorial, you just go on Google and type GFLNet tutorial and you'll eventually find it. And uh, also want to mention quickly that why I got into this, all of this like complicated machine learning with so many threads is because I, because of the pandemic and I started thinking about, oh gee, like we need antivirals. Um, and, uh, and then I learned about antimicrobial resistance, which is like the next pandemic that's coming to us, like a train, like climate change is, is going to us, which is gonna cost a lot of lives and, and money to the world. And we don't have good tools to, to, to design these drugs. Um, we need machine learning to do that. Um, and, um, and actually then I, I found, oh, you can apply the same techniques to search for things that are important for climate change, like discovering new materials that are just like, kind of like molecules. All right, I'll stop here. Thank you so much for the great talk, Professor ben -Gil. If you have any question in the room, please, there's a mic here. Raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. Um, um, hello. Uh, just uh, I can you, want... can you just 
if you ask questions, can you keep them brief so there's yeah, more people yeah. who can yes. ask? Okay. Um, there's a method creating accent. Uh, just uh, you have, for example, you have the sequence. You put the sequence into the language model and then you have some proxy to predict some value. To predict what? Predict, uh, for example, the um, property to kill the bacteria. Okay, yes. And uh, I see some recent work, but they do not take this as a baseline. And I want to know how you think about this method. Gradient ascent. If you feed a proxy, then you, this proxy right, takes right, the right, sequence. Right. So, so you can do a local search. That's what gradient based methods do is a local search, right? You can do. But uh, in fact, if uh, when you mutate uh, even one residue, and right. then this property can change or not. Right, right, but that's a problem, yeah. It's local in the sequence space, but it, it, it is not local right. in the embedding space. I understand. Uh, so what do you think about this method? Well, I, you know, I think there, there's a number of papers exploring this sort of thing where in order to do search in the space of drugs, we map the drug specification like a sequence into a real vector and then we do the optimization in that space. Is that okay. what you mean? Yeah. So, so, so that's one way to go, but in itself, it, it will only do like a local search. And the way that you can have like different uh, diversity of solutions, it is to like initialize in different places and then do the local search, which is something by the way, people do in MCMC as well, but uh, it, the problem is that the things you care about might be like these needles in the haystack and just randomly throwing darts and then locally optimizing is not sufficient in general. Okay. Some were just uh, perform gradient isn't in the latent space for example. Oh, I mean, this, these local things like gradient based things, they could be very useful for local, you know, optimizing, oh, okay. you know, getting to the really good thing, but, but it, it's not enough to find the new modes. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I had a question regarding the structural models that you presented. Uh, what if the variables are unknown? Like, uh, like you said that there can oh, yeah. be many variables and GFRONET is uh, right, able right. to- Yeah, I, I actually, it was in my slide, but it, it was near the end. And uh, yeah, so when you're trying to discover a causal model, the traditional way of doing things in the causality literature is assume that all those variables are observed and you're just trying to find out which causes which. But the kinds of things we in machine learning are interested in is when often a lot of the variables are not observed, they are latent. We make up things, we make up concepts that help us understand the low level stuff that we observe. So, you know, that's what deep learning is about. It's finding representations of abstract things that help to make sense of the low level stuff. And we need to do the same things in causality. And this is an open problem. And this is something that um, I'm very interested in. And you know, people in my group are working on, but it, I don't think there are like really good solutions. And even at a theoretical level, there are important questions about, can we even uh, you know, identify the right space in which uh, this constant structure exists? Oh, the problem in general is not that. The problem is that there are too many solutions. So that's the identifiability problem. And so there's a lot of work going on here and in other places around the world to try to figure out under what conditions um, you, you will have only one solution that, that survives. But my belief is that this is too, so it leads to too strong assumptions. And so the solution is instead to be Bayesian and to say, Let's try to capture all the solutions that are compatible with the data. Of course, it's a, it's a tough call, but I think that's what we need to do. Thanks for the talk. So my question is just about the big picture, about yeah. all the concepts that you introduced. Like if you go back to the framework of, um, like in the first slide yes, where you have scientific yes. discovery framework. The cycle of experiments. Yeah. Is your idea to like replace each part of the pipeline <laughs> with a model or are you yes. thinking of- Yeah, uh, I, that's basically what I'm saying. I, I mean, uh, 
that we can have machine learning at all, almost, almost at every stage here. So there is the modeling part. In other words, we take data and we construct theories that explain the data. Then there is the experimental design part, which is given a model that knows what theories are compatible with the data, what experiment should we do? Then there's the experiments themselves, which are more and more like automated as well. And machine learning can play a role there. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I think science is going to be oddly transformed by the use of machine learning in these experimental settings. Online. Um, hi. So, um, um, uh, thank you for thank you very much for the talk. Um, uh, as a community, should we do you think we um, should we if we want to solve problems here, do you think we should all focus on one specific problems, or should we try to make progress in solving problem uh, like make creating problem specific algorithms? Um. So what I try to do, working on a couple of these problems is to abstract out what they have in common. That's what I've tried to explain today. And hopefully this can, gives us, this can give us general purpose principles, tools, methods, algorithms that could work across a large number of scientific endeavors. But of course, you know, there was the first question about some specific um, knowledge we may have about a particular domain, and that's going to be specific to the domain. But but even like if you if you look, uh, you know you know physics, there's like lots and lots of physical problems. You know, uh, you know from astrophysics to uh, climate modeling, and they can share a lot of principles across these particular problems. So, um. I think the, the answer is we need many people to explore these things, both in the sense of different ways of, so, of tackling these questions from like a machine learning and AI point of view, but also from the point of view of diversity of problems in which we apply this to learn how to do that better. 